So, um, welcome everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Joshua Chuang. I'm the chief curator here at the Center for Creative Photography. And we're uh, here tonight, uh, we're very honored to have tonight uh, um, Stephen Strom uh, guide us through uh, this, this exhibition, uh, Astronomical Photographs of Our Solar System and Beyond. Um, and just a little bit about Steve, I'll, I'll try to make this short so he has as much time as possible to, to um, share with us his perspective and, and in, insights about this subject which he knows so much about. Steve is um, uh, many things, but uh, foremost uh, an, an astronomer and a uh, fine art photographer. And he's managed um, um, in his life to um, uh, intermingle, intertwine the, the two. And so you'll actually see in one of the other galleries uh, works by, by Steve that, 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 that mix the two disciplines. Um, uh, uh, in, in a previous life, he was uh, associate director of the National Optical Astronomy Observatory. And um, so uh, someone who's uh, very well credentialed to speak on the subject. He was also uh, one of the co-organizers co of, of this exhibition. Um, uh, when I had the uh, idea to do an exhibition on this subject, uh, really I, I, I knew very little about the, the field of uh, astronomy or astronomical photogra photography. And uh, uh, one of my first calls was to Steve to say, hey, can you, can you, can you tell me what you know and can you, can you, can you, can you help, please help. Um, so he regretted this question. But no, no, he did not. Uh, um, but he was a tremendous help. And, uh, he, had, he had so much to say that uh, we couldn't actually um, fit it on the, the wall text. So we commissioned Steve to um, write these, these uh, laminated texts, which are uh, found throughout the exhibition. Um, they're called In More Depth. So therefore, viewers of the exhibition, in case you want to know more about any specific object or any specific phenomenon depicted in, in the photographs, um, you, you'll find uh, the key to it uh, on, on these cards. So without further ado, Steve Strong. My goodness. I'm trying to figure out how to project, and it looks like I'm going to have to, to rotate since we don't have surround sound. But uh, thanks for coming. I appreciate your, uh, your coming to the center. And uh, I hope today to uh, walk you through the uh, exhibit. And just to give you an overview, many of you have had a chance to, to wander through already. But for those who haven't, we're going to start in this room, which has to do uh, mostly with uh, efforts to, uh, over the century plus, to chart the sky. And then in the next, uh, in the next room, we'll uh, look uh, uh, first at some uh, images of the, uh, of the sun during uh, eclipse. You're, many of you will recall that uh, just the other day when there was a, 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 an eclipse of the total eclipse of, this, uh, of the sun uh, whose path uh, passed over parts of, of Europe, and then we'll go uh, into uh, uh, an area where we'll look at photographs of the uh, of the moon spanning a wide range of uh, of, of time, uh, culminating, I think, with uh, uh, the uh, images that were taken by uh, astronauts during uh, one of the lunar uh, landings. Uh, and I'd like to stop there uh, a little bit, not only to talk about the aesthetics of the, uh, of the lunar images, uh, but also uh, what can be gleaned from them uh, scientifically and how important uh, the Apollo mission was, uh, not only to uh, informing uh, uh, understanding of those, uh, of those lunar images and the time scale for events and uh, transpired throughout the solar system, but also, of course, uh, in inspiring um, uh, uh, a couple of generations of young people to enter into science and inspiring a, a, a nation as a whole. And there's a wonderful clip in, uh, in there from President Kennedy's uh, speech uh, uh, to the nation in which the Apollo program was, was uh, launched. And uh, I'll just note uh, that I had uh, one during, during some previous uh, uh, life, uh, I uh, had the great privilege of standing at the lectern where President Kennedy gave that talk, and it was one of the more uh, inspiring and, in fact, chilling moments of my life. And we'll move around um, into uh, uh, the, uh, a room where there are, are uh, a set of 
uh, images of a variety of planets, uh, and uh, in particular, uh, an ongoing uh, video display uh, of uh, images taken from the Morris Reconnaissance Orbiter by the high-rise ca uh, camera developed here at the University of Arizona. And then we'll return once again to the sun to look at uh, images uh, taken by the Solar Dynamics ex uh, Explorer, images that are, uh, are incre incredible, at least to my eyes, uh, uh, just as, as aesthetic objects, but also informative about uh, how energy propagates from the interior of the sun to its million degree corona. So uh, I also wanted this to encourage uh, interruption because the purpose isn't to hear my voice. I hear it all the time, both internally and, and uh, as it reflects off various boundaries. But uh, the important thing is to ask me questions, whether they be about uh, the photographic uh, qualities of the, of the images or their astronomical uh, meanings. I'll probably be able to talk more intelligently about the latter than the former, but I'll try. And if Josh and Andrew are here both to speak uh, to areas of the photographic history, to areas of photographic history that I can. So what's here? What you see here uh, is uh, a photographic uh, atlas. It's one of the first atlases that were um, that was made. You know, people have been recording positions of stars and planets for for, for literally for millennia, but uh, the ability to see beyond what you can uh, uh, perceive with your one-inch diameter um, eye uh, wasn't really possible uh, until uh, photography came into, uh, into being. And this atlas uh, implicitly records uh, both positions of stars and other objects and their brightnesses. And by uh, um, doing so and taking multiple images over time, it's possible to study variations in brightness and variations in position. And in this the case of this particular atlas, uh, uh, many variable brightness objects were discovered, and a large number of asteroids were discovered by comparing the locations of images on uh, one plate to another. These early, this early atlas was able to record objects about a factor of 100 or a few hundred uh, uh, fainter than uh, the eye could see. And uh, the relatively small gain, it was a factor of 100, that's a pretty large gain, but the relatively small gain compared to what I'll show you in a, uh, in a minute resulted from the fact that early on, the efficiency of photographic plates in recording uh, incoming light, quanta of light, photons, um, the efficiency, so so-called quantum efficiency, was, uh, was quite low. And as a result, uh, not many incoming quanta of light resulted in uh, excitation of what eventually became deposits of silver on this on these emulsion. So what, what period of time was this? These were, I think, around, uh, remind me, around 1900, but I can't. Yep, uh, 1900 to 1906 or 7, something like that. So behind you uh, is, the, is the culmination of uh, photographic efforts to record the entire uh, sky. This is an example from the Palomar Sky Survey made with a 48-inch diameter telescope on much more fo sensitive photographic emulsions than uh, uh, the nose that were used to make this particular uh, atlas. These were taken in both blue light, where f most photographic plates are most sensitive, but also in specially developed uh, emulsions sensitive to yellow light, and oh, there's another series sensitive to, to red light. And the ability to, re uh, to, to record uh, uh, at different wavelengths provides very important information on uh, the temperatures of stars, the colors of galaxies, which tell you something about how far away they are, or what their chemical composition is, and so on. Those are uh, examples of, of, uh, of an atlas that uh, went something like 100 million times as faint as the, uh, as the human eye could, uh, could see. That was an all-sky atlas. Here's an example of, of the deepest view that we have of space to date. This is the Hubble Deep 
the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And uh, this was made, of course, with the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, it is a color composite uh, uh, image that was put together from images taken through various color filters. The recording device uh, for uh, uh, these images is a so-called charge couple device, or CCD, similar to the, de uh, to the device that sits in your camera or your iPhone or whatever. Uh, but um, again, you look at objects here. This is a color composite. So there are a lot of very red objects. And those, generally speaking, are distant galaxies. Virtually every object in this field of view is a distant galaxy. And you can see back in time to uh, galaxies and their predecessors that are no older than about a billion years after the Big Bang that gave rise to the, uh, uh, to the, um, uh, to the universe. There is, not shown here, but there are complementary images uh, taken by, uh, by a camera developed here at the University of Arizona called NICMOS, a camera that operates at infrared wavelengths and records galaxies even further away than those uh, seen in the Hubble <coughs> Ultra Deep Field. This is about three arc minutes angular diameter, about the ten a tenth the diameter of the moon uh, is exhibited here. So this is an example of a very deep view over a very small field of view, as opposed to the Palomar Sky Survey, which was um, an effort to map uh, at much uh, lower sensitivity uh, over the entire sky. So one was a survey, and this is a survey in depth, a survey in area, and a survey in depth. So. Steve, can I, may I ask a question? Sure. Uh, so this version of the image, I think, is dated 2014, just last year. But some aspect of the same image has been avail available for quite some time. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, there was, uh, I'm trying to remember when the first exam, there was a, uh, uh, sorry. Let me preface this by saying time on the Hubble Space Telescope is, is, is uh, a, a, a highly desirable uh, uh, resource. Uh, and it is much fought for by, uh, uh, by astronomers who send in uh, uh, proposals to a, a telescope allocation committee which tries to decide which of the many proposals they get are to be scheduled on the Hubble Space Telescope. So getting a few hours of time or 10 hours of time with the Hubble Space Telescope, at least in its early stages, was a real challenge. The director of the observatory at the time that the first Hubble Deep Field was, uh, was taken, Bob Williams, who was formerly a professor here at the University of Arizona, uh, uh, decided that he would spend uh, uh, a million seconds uh, making, this, uh, making this image, uh, or not this one, but a precursor called the Hubble Deep Field as opposed to Ultra Deep Field. And uh, it was uh, a courageous decision because it meant that the time couldn't be awarded to other scientists. Uh, and, but uh, never, nevertheless, it's been a source of, of, of uh, an incredible amount of, of uh, follow-up work. And it's given us a real understanding of uh, the kinds of, uh, of uh, objects that precede today's uh, galaxies, the kind of galaxies that you see in in, uh, in pictures, spirals and ellipticals and so on. Earlier on, there, um, the, the uh, galaxies were a lot less well-formed uh, than their uh, current day um, uh, descendants. So You're using the word atlas. Is that because these are star maps and this is a collection of star maps? That's or correct. Is it more complicated than that? It's not more complicated than that. It's just exactly as if, as if you were taking the Rand McNally of the sky. So instead of Rand McNally, the analog would be the Rand McNally of the Earth. That is every country on Earth with all the roads and so on. And this is just uh, a, a collection of images that span the entire sky. Are there any other questions before we into moon? So, uh, Andrew. About how many solar systems are contained in each one of those galaxies? Oh my goodness. Uh, well, the answer is uh, roughly speaking, uh, uh, virtually every um, star of mass comparable to or, or, or even larger than the, uh, than the sun and lots lower seems to have, be surrounded by a, a planetary system. We know that from 
uh, uh, the uh, statistics that follow from both, uh, uh, well, largely from the Kepler, uh, Kepler mission. So every time you look at a galaxy, there are roughly 100 million stars, and roughly all of them have solar systems. So every, you know, just I don't know how many are in. I think there's somebody said a number. It may even be on there. It may be 10,000 or something like that. But anyway, there are 10,000 galaxies and 100 million stars per galaxy. So you can do the math, and it's, what is that? 10 to the fourth, 10 to the uh, uh, 10 to the eighth. So it's 10 to the twelfth. It's a uh, it's a good um, it's a <laughs> it's a uh, terra something of of um, t of uh, it's a trillion solar systems. Can you just remind me about some really basic astronomy? So what we're seeing here are like really, the, 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 the stars here are maybe all dead and gone, but like the, or the galaxies may be gone by, by now, but because of this great distance, the light's traveling, or is that not the case with this photograph? Uh, the answer is that the light is traveling a large, uh, a large distance, but that we're actually looking at galaxies, therefore, that are very, very young. So that's how they appear when they're when they're uh, they they're young, so that the faintest things in in here are the young and the, and the most distant are the are are the youngest, and in point of fact there are stars in 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 in, in our own galaxy for example that will um, that will live to 50 billion to 100 billion years old. Some very low mass stars will do that because they burn their uh, their hydrogen at a low enough rate that that they won't consume their 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 nuclear fuel for that long. Yes. So the <coughs> deep field is comprised of many images layered on top of each other. Yes, yeah, that's right. And you know, so the the Hubble Space Telescope, you know, I've forgotten what the orbital time is, but let's say it's about 100 minutes, which I think is close to what it is. Somebody might in this audience might know. And, but it's like that, and you can expose for, depending upon where you are and so on, some fraction of that. I think it's 50 minutes, somewhere between 40 and 50 minutes. And yes, you, in order to produce those images, you stack images from the same wavelength, and then there are images taken over multiple wavelengths, and so you stack the blue images, the red images, mm -hmm. and so and, and and so on. And as you stack each of the uh, images, you go deeper and deeper, and so on. I'm going to wander into the other room and and answer uh, other questions. I'm going to also mention that the University of Arizona is um, putting together perhaps the most elaborate atlas-making telescope of all time. It's a device called the Hubble, sorry, the uh, Large Synoptic Survey uh, Telescope. And um, it, yeah. Oh, this is a really stupid question. What? What's the difference between a planet and a star? Uh, a, planet of a, 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 a planet is a, a, an, an entity, either gaseous or gas plus uh, solid or solid alone. That has no internal uh, that has no internal uh, energy source. So it, it to see it, you need to generally speaking. There are some exceptions, but generally speaking, you need to to you're seeing it by reflected light. Uh, in the case of uh, sorry, mature planets are seen largely via reflected light. For stars, they're they're um, um, they derive their their uh, their uh, energy. Uh, uh, internally, in, in a mature state, from transformation of light elements into heavier elements, nuclear reactions. So they're powered in, internally. Earlier on, they can also be powered by uh, gravitational contraction and conversion of gravitational energy into heat. So in a galaxy, we'll have a sun, too. We'll have hundreds of millions of suns, okay. individual suns. So that when you look at a galaxy, you're looking at, at, at the at at the combined light of, of several hundred million suns. Yes? Sorry, another question. So, and you mentioned earlier that like older or younger, younger galaxies have different shapes, like elliptical and spirals, and you said that was it the older ones that have? The older ones look nice and regular and so on. The younger ones look, look much more ratty, uh, irregular, if you will. There's an official term. They're, well, we call them irregular. They're ratty looking. And, and it turns out that, that what makes today's galaxies are actually the, the uh, mergers of younger galaxies. So uh, way back when, when the universe was a lot more dense and the galaxies were a lot closer to one another, 
uh, there were, the frequency of collision between galaxies was a lot higher. And in those, in those collisions, uh, there was not only um, a couple of things happened. One, lots of stars were formed as gas clouds collided one with another. Another thing that happened is that the material in the galaxies were, was gravitationally rearranged in, in, and after multiple mergers, the rearrangement led to much more regular shapes. So. All right. This is from the collection of a, a photographer by the name of Richard Lauren. And these are, of course, images of eclipses of the sun. And they span uh, uh, almost a century, I think, of, uh, of, of imaging. And uh, you might say, you know, other, well, Eclipses are just compelling. Uh, I have yet to see a total solar eclipse. So I'm, you know, someday it will happen, I hope, before I uh, need an, another vantage point uh, for, <laughs> that's a hope, you know, I mean, uh, for viewing an eclipse. But, uh, you know, you can appreciate these as, as aesthetic objects. You could also put yourself in the mind of our, pre our, our predecessors and imagine them as, um, as uh, portentous uh, 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 event, you know, portenting, sorry, is that the right word? Anyway, portents of, of, of either good things or bad things happening. And priests of, of old who had the knowledge to predict eclipses held a great deal of power. The images have a great deal of power, I think, aesthetically as well. But as usual, is a great scientific story about photography and, um, and science. Okay, when you look at, the, uh, at these images of the, of the sun, you see the, these irregular regions extending out from, uh, from the blocked disk of the sun. The disk of the sun is called the, that we can see is called the photosphere. This extended um, feature is called the corona, and it's, uh, it, it's um, a plasma. Uh, atoms stripped of their electrons along with electrons themselves at temperatures of about uh, uh, a million or a few million degrees. So being able to block out with the moon, the light of the sun allows you to see this other part of the sun. You can see in this image of the, of the sun, this reddish glow around the edge. It looks as another, at another part of the sun called the chromosphere, and because it's colorful. And it, this, uh, this reddish glow comes from the fact that you're looking at hydrogen gas at a temperature of about 10,000 degrees. So you see that. Uh, the other thing uh, that should be mentioned is uh, that the uh, uh, photographic records of um, the, uh, if you break up the light in, of, of the chromosphere into its compon uh, component wavelengths, it turns out that you can look at the signatures of a large number of chemical elements, and it turns out that one of the chemical elements that was first discovered on the sun, not on the Earth, is helium, the second um, lightest element known in the universe. So um, that's true. Photographs of, of the sun during eclipse also led to one of the major discoveries of the 20th century. The fact that uh, stars located behind uh, the sun had their position changed as light from those stars propagated past the sun. Why? The sun has mass, and it warps space-time around uh, the object and slightly causes a slight deviation from a straight line in the propagation of light from stars back around to the sun, past the sun, to the Earth. This is a, one of the major predictions of Einstein's theory of relativity. And photographs taken when the sun was not in the path of those stars, and then during an eclipse when the sun was, was uh, right in front of those stars, showed uh, allowed measurement of the relative positions of stars uh, at varying distances from the sun's disk, and in fact confirmed Einstein's um, uh, theory of relativity. Those photographs were taken in 1919. So we're ready to transition. Um, so here are some wonderful examples of observatories. The Wick Observatory here, uh, 
<clears throat> this is, I believe, an Ansel Adams photograph of uh, the University of California, California's Shane Reflecting Telescope, a 120-inch diameter telescope. Uh, and uh, this is a photograph of uh, one of the largest telescopes that was available at the beginning of the, of the 20th century, the 36-inch uh, refracting telescope uh, at uh, the Yerkes Observatory in Wisconsin. Uh, let's see, there are photographs here from the Lick Observatory uh, that were used as art, ob uh, that were uh, reused or repurposed as art objects by Linda, uh, Linda Connor. So you might want to look at those. Uh, let's see, there is um, uh, there are a pair of wonderful photographs taken of the multi-mirror telescope, now a single uh, mirror telescope on the top of Mount Hopkins, southeast of, of Tucson, a joint project of the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory and the University of, Ari uh, of Arizona and one of the larger telescopes, a six meter diameter telescope operating in the continental you know, United States. So before we get to the moon, I'm gonna entertain more questions. Yeah. Yes, sorry I have my shades on because I forgot my other ones. But. Uh, there is, um, try to remember, uh, I, the answer is it's there. There's uh, telemetry from the uh, from the, the telescope. I think, but I don't remember. I should know because I believe they're sent through uh, the, the, that the that the radio transmissions from the Hubble are pro, are, are are received by um, uh, parts of the Jet Propulsion Lab's deep space network. There are antennas. Uh, spread out over the over the globe, and I believe it's that set of antennas that captures the radio signals from the Hubble. But I, I, I frankly don't remember. But the, the the general answer to your question is, it's it's te it's radio telemetry from the from the from the telescope, and there's also a uh, there's an uh, uh, an onboard computer with a relative with an incredibly tiny to compared to today's standards um, uh, memory cache. <coughs> Others? All right, now to the moon. First, I'd ask you to look at these images as, as aesthetic objects. They're photographs. Uh, and uh, they are startling photo, um, uh, photographs, at least to my, uh, to my eye. And um, they were taken for a variety of purposes. Early on, uh, uh, lunar photographs, the moon was one of the first objects to, to be photographed, the sun being the other. The reason, of course, was that the sensitivity of early photographic materials was very low, and only the brightest objects could be photographed. You recall when we were talking about atlases in the other room that we gained about a factor of 100 compared to what the eye could, uh, could, um, uh, could see. Uh, and uh, in the mid 1850s, when the first astronomical, or late 40s and early 50s, when the uh, first astronomical photographs were taken, only the moon and sun could be could be recorded. What you see here uh, are uh, images that were uh, taken uh, uh, in preparation for uh, the uh, the lunar land uh, lunar landings at first. At, at the University of Arizona, there was originally an, uh, an effort uh, led by Gerard Kuiper, the founder of the Lunar and Planetary Lab, to put together uh, images which would allow, uh, which would uh, 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 allow a com an atlas of the complete lunar, lunar surface to be uh, to be assembled. And the original atlas comprised images take, taken from a variety of ground-based observatories over the world. Later, uh, uh, images were taken from uh, orbiting uh, spacecraft and, uh, uh, and were taken in order to select some of the uh, landing areas for uh, the lunar landers. And there was a desire to, uh, to not only find a place where you could land safely, but also assuming the ability to, to, uh, to uh, visit, to, to land men on the moon and return them to Earth. Uh, to pick parts of the uh, of the moon, which would lead to a deeper scientific understanding of uh, of uh, uh, of the lunar uh, of the lunar surface. 
So, you know, what you see here on, uh, uh, on these images are a whole bunch of, of craters. And when you take a look further back, there's parts of the, of the moon which are heavily cratered and parts of the moon that are, appear to be very lightly uh, cratered. There are craters of different size. Typically, you see a few, uh, that there are uh, fewer large craters than there are smaller uh, craters. Uh, and um, you might ask, what in heaven's name do craters tell us? Well, it turns out that combined with uh, the, uh, uh, the analyses of rocks brought back to Earth and dated using uh, radioisotope techniques, and I'll answer a question about that in a minute, um, these rocks can be just take for the moment that, these, that you can ascribe an age to a rock sample that the astronauts brought back from, uh, from the moon. It turns out that um, by uh, landing in some of these areas where there's not a lot of crater, cratering and areas where there was a lot of, of, of cratering, that it's possible to, uh, in essence, use cratering as a clock. That is, you can look at surf at areas like those nearly craterless areas on the, uh, on the moon, measure their ages, and it, uh, measure, measure the ages of the rocks, and it turns out that those are relatively young regions. And it, what it's telling you is that these were, uh, these were areas uh, that were relatively recently formed that covered up previously cratered uh, uh, parts of the moon. Whereas when you're looking at a heavily cratered region of the, uh, of the moon, there hasn't been a lot of, uh, of, of change. In point of fact, these, these lightly cratered regions are regions where there were volcanic flows that covered up the heavily cratered regions. And by looking at the, at the ages of those lunar maria where there, were vol where there was volcano, uh, volcanic activity, and counting the number of, of, of craters in those regions, you have age, and then you have number of craters per unit area that you can actually measure from these photographs. And you say, aha, uh -huh, if I look at a part of a, of, 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 a, uh, of a surface on another moon surrounding another planet, and count a similar number of craters per unit area, I can assign, by presumption, an age comparable to the age found from radioisotopic um, measurements on the moon. Similarly, when you look at a heavily cratered region on another part or uh, 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 on another moon or another planetary surface, like Mars, for example, you can age date uh, that region by saying, aha, the uh, lunar rocks brought back in a heavily cratered region correspond to an age, say, of 3.7 billion years ago. Uh, and you can assign that age based on cratering, since we haven't brought back samples uh, from, uh, from other moons and other planets as yet. So uh, President Kennedy's speech uh, is among the, uh, among the entities on that little video screen over there. And as I mentioned, it was enormously uh, 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 it was something that excited me and it excited generations of, of, of scientists and also uh, stimulated a great deal of investment in American science and uh, obviously led not only to these wonderful geological studies and dating of surfaces, but it also supplied a lot of the, of the passion and energy of the engineers uh, and scientists who have driven the development of the American economy to, to, till today. Questions? Um, I notice there's a, in every of all these images, there's this linear pattern going on, and I'm sure it has to do with a scanning device. But can you yeah. explain that a little bit? I believe that these, these were, in fact, strip maps taken, I, you may remember, yeah, Josh. Yeah, like on that wall, the, all those have a linear yeah. pattern. Yes, they're strip maps put together in this way. These, these were literally done, I guess, they, I, I don't know whether they were taken during successive uh, orbits or, or not. I suspect that's how they were done. Maybe you remember. But they're, and then they were literally put together by hand at the time. You know, this is something you'd do in an instant with Photoshop these days. But this, is, this was done painfully by hand. And um, it turns out that, that um, there were uh, efforts made uh, to, um, uh, 
to create from ground-based images to create uh, maps that would be applicable as you were flying over the lunar surface. And uh, I don't, did we, you didn't include that little globe, did you? The one on, oh, there is. Uh, if you look over there, it turns out that, that people projected those images on a globe uh, and uh, then um, uh, were able to take out the, um, the foreshortening effects from photographing from the ground. So. This? Uh, it, well, I believe it was, and, and by it, what would happen to film is it's not the vacuum so much as uh, there are various other things that expose it, like cosmic rays hitting the uh, hitting the emulsion and so on. But I believe they were. I don't believe that they were protected in any way. I may be wrong, but I don't. I, I don't remember that's being the case. Don't they have negatives at optical science? I remember as a graduate student going in and looking, they, they have files of, of, I don't know if they're these, of, of negatives yep. this size, the yeah. strips. So, yeah, I, and I don't, um, these you, were. You used to be able to go in and handle them. I think you guys. I think you, I think you still can. Yeah, you can make an appointment and, and, mm -hmm. and, and touch the stuff. But I also know that, you know, a lot of these, the, the, the film after it was exposed, a lot of that developed on board. These, these, these unmanned, um, you know, these unmanned uh, missions. So, um, I, I assume to lessen the effect of other. You know, I, I I don't remember. Yeah. Goodbye. Right. And any other other questions about the moon? Okay, let's move on to the planets. So these are in order. We have Mercury first. And you know, to zero order, you look at this, and it looks like the moon. And uh, the reason is that Mercury, the closest planet to the, to the sun, uh, is cratered. Now, I'm going to tell you something else about craters. Uh, they tell you uh, not, not only uh, sort of quantitatively by the number of those craters per unit area, uh, how old uh, the surface expo was, how long ago the surface was exposed to bombardment by asteroids and comets. Those are the things that uh, crashing into the surface of a planet that produces the craters. It turns out that it tells you um, sort of philosophically, if you will, that the early history of the solar system was very violent. And in point of fact, our Earth was much as the galaxies we talked about uh, before, the irregular galaxies building into the larger galaxies that we see today, well, it turns out that the formation of planets was also uh, uh, a result of hierarchical uh, agglomeration. So that you know, little particle, uh, initially particles of dust, about a micron in size, collided and built bigger and bigger objects. And then kilometer-sized bodies collided to build bigger and bigger objects. And, the Earth itself was built out of, out of collisions between uh, asteroid and comet-like uh, bodies uh, until it reached the size of, of, of well, um, it, until it reached some significant fraction of the, Earth's, uh, of the Earth's size and then continued to grow um, uh, by sucking in uh, nearby so-called planetesimals, kilometer-sized bodies. So this cratering tells you that there has been a continuous bombardment uh, since the beginning of the solar system. And that very bombardment produced uh, uh, planets like the Earth, like Mercury, and, and so on. And then after they were formed, they continued to be bombarded. And of course, we're, we, you, know, you look up in the sky in, so let's say, the middle of August and look, look for a few hours in the, in the morning and see the Perseid meteor shower, you know that we're still being bombarded uh, today by remnants of comets and, and, uh, and, and asteroids. So the formation of the solar system was a very violent event. And in fact, the, the Earth-Moon system itself is a result of a giant collision between a Mars-sized object and the proto-Earth. And it's that that produced um, the Earth and the Moon, the Moon itself being the largest um, satellite uh, known in the solar system around another planet. Okay, so here's Venus. 
So um, these pictures of, of, of Venus are photographs, but photographs in a very, uh, of a very different sort. It turns out that Venus is surrounded by a, uh, an opaque uh, atmosphere. Uh, that opaque atmosphere is largely composed of carbon dioxide. And because carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, even though Venus is only a modest amount closer to the sun, its surface temperature is almost 900 degrees Fahrenheit. That's because carbon dioxide traps the heat uh, inside of Venus's atmosphere. So uh, it's a perfect example of global warming on another planet. You can't see through the atmosphere at optical wavelengths. You can't see through the atmosphere at infrared wavelengths. But radar can be used to penetrate the atmosphere. And these images were, uh, were made uh, by radar, uh, a, a satellite that orbited Venus and produced these radar maps of its, surf of, uh, of its surface. And of course, you can see craters, but not many craters which suggests that the surface of uh, Venus that we now see was exposed relatively recently, possibly as a result of extensive volcanic activity on the surface. Behind you, I'm sorry to make everybody turn around, are wonderful images that were, ta that, that were taken by uh, the Mars Reconnaissance uh, Orbiter. As I mentioned, the University of Arizona has a device called a high-rise camera, and that camera uh, uh, orbits around with the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and uh, creates long strip maps of which these photographs are, uh, are uh, clipped out. Photographs are available in a publicly accessible, uh, pub sorry, in a, pub in a, in a, a publicly accessible uh, database uh, that you can access. It's available on the U of A uh, Lunar and Planetary Lab uh, website, on the Jet Propulsion Lab website, and one of, I'll mention in passing that the ability to access these, these, um, uh, these uh, images uh, is uh, a requirement placed on, uh, on all NASA images, whether they are Hubble Space Telescope images, or Mars images, or Jupiter images, or whatever. They are publicly available no more than 18 months after they're taken. And that's a very important, I mean, folks paid for it and uh, they ought to have access to it. And these are used for scientific purposes, for artistic purposes, and the uh, images, for example, that will be taken with the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope will also be made publicly uh, available as well. So it means public domain and you can exploit them in the one? That's correct. Well, you have to give credit to, the, to, um, to NASA, but there's, there's a little instruction thing that shows, uh, sorry, there is a, a set of instructions for uh, attribution, and it's as simple as saying, you know, acquired by high-rise uh, on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, courtesy Lunar and Planetary Lab, or courtesy NASA, and whatever the words are. Some, but, you know, there, there's instructions on it. So, so uh, let's see. Mars, it's, you, it's worth, for those of you who come back, it's really worth spending time and looking at the um, terrain on Mars, which is awfully reminiscent of, uh, of the terrain on Earth. For example, you'll see as you flash through evidence of, of channels, there's one here uh, where you can see channels which were uh, produced by, uh, I don't know what the heck produced that, but in any event, <laughs> but, but, but the, you can see, for example, water uh, uh, channels produced by water which once flowed on the surface of Mars, perhaps for a few hundred million years after the formation of that planet four and a half billion years ago. There are sand dunes on Mars. There are, uh, there's evidence of volcanic activity uh, on Mars. You can see uh, in that particular image, uh, the bluish white uh, is uh, carbon dioxide ice uh, frozen out on the surface of, uh, of Mars. Uh, this, I believe, is probably taken near the pole of Mars. That's the bluish stuff is carbon dioxide ice. The reddish stuff is our layers of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of surface iron-rich dust. Uh, what kind of scale are you looking at? Uh, those typically, uh, those are, I don't know, they're probably a, a couple of miles wide and a mile uh, up and uh, vertically. So um, let's see. 
multiple photographs taken, um, I believe they're taken from the Cassini mission. Yeah. Yes. And um, so everybody has seen Saturn as a ringed planet. It's gorgeous. These, you know, just taken as objects, never mind what they are. Um, they're, they're incredible. The patterns are gorgeous. Does anybody know what causes these ring-like structures? Ice. Ice. Ice crystals. Ah, that, yes, indeed. Uh, there's ice and dust that, that, in fact, are scattering light, sunlight, earthward. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but what accounts for the fact that it's not continuous? Moons. Yep. Yes, and so uh, you can see, if you look really carefully, uh, you can see these moons, which are called shepherd moons, and it's the gravitational interaction between those moons and the orbiting dust and, and ice um, that uh, produces these ring-like patterns, and it's, it's ev every little um, uh, gap you know, in this distribution of uh, ice and dust orbiting, uh, orbiting the planet. Uh, uh, is, uh, well, the gaps are produced by a shepherding moon. So these little moons have an enormous uh, effect. And it turns out um, that um, the same sort of physics that accounts for these gaps uh, is being used to infer the, uh, the presence of forming planets uh, surrounding very young stars still in the process of assembling their solar system. And uh, those gaps are manifest both uh, indirectly and uh, by looking at the at brightness as a function of color and looking for essentially gaps in that uh, in that uh, in that distribution of brightness versus color and now uh, there are actual images being made by at millimeter wavelengths by a huge multi telescope uh, array in Chile where in fact we've seen planets in the active for, uh, of, of forming by, in fact, observing these gaps directly as opposed to inferring them. Can I ask a question about color? Sure. So we're seeing some in black and white and some in color. And I worked with somebody years ago at JPL when they were getting Voyager 2 images from yeah. Saturn back. And he was a video artist. And he was also a video, he was doing all this video graphics and visualizing it. They weren't photographs as yeah. much as. How do you ascertain what colors you're using? Well, that's a good question. And um, it, it depends upon the purpose that you're, that, okay, so. He was selling NASA. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get, yeah, I get that. And, you know, it's, but, but you know, it, one for the Hubble space, uh, for the Hubble deep field, those are pretty close to what the eye could see if the eye had the sensitivity of a CCD camera and stacked up a million hour, million seconds of Hubble <clears throat> exposure. So that's pretty close to true color. Sometimes, you know, you, what you're, you know, you're trying to infer uh, the mineral content uh, by looking at multi-wavelength images, wi images taken with different color filters. And there, you may use artificial color, that is coding you know, let's say uh, uh, a magnesium rich mineral, suppose it were coated red and a silicon rich mineral that would might be cold, coated blue, you might get the spectacular uh, looking image from an artistic standpoint, but it would also be a way of visualizing the mineral con content, which otherwise might be manifest from very, very subtle color changes. So there's a question of visualization. And then there's the issue of, well, there are some colors that, like the radar, even though that's a black and white image, it's conceivable that you might have radar images taken at different radar wavelengths. And you might be, for whatever reason, you might want to, uh, to create an artificial uh, or false color uh, image that uh, also was allowing to, you to visualize things that were well outside the human eye's ability to record. So. And then, of course, there's the sexy image for net selling NASA, so there's that. OK, so Neptune has rings also. Uh, Neptune also has, uh, has, elaborate, um, I mean, has elaborate atmospheric circulation patterns, clouds uh, that uh, study of, of the atmospheres of, of 
uh, Saturn and Uranus and Jupiter uh, allow you to uh, test your models of, uh, of uh, atmospheric physics so that you can uh, uh, make more sophisticated models of atmospheric uh, circulation on Earth. So using these, these uh, external bodies and deepening your understanding of the, of the role of temperature variation with height, uh, pressure variation with height, chemical composition with height, the presence of ices and so on, you can gain a, a, a much more sophisticated understanding of the drivers of atmospheric physics under a variety of different circumstances and use that understanding to better understand what goes on uh, on Earth. So lots of rings and uh, here these beautiful circulation patterns that you can see, storms on, uh, on Jupiter. A close-up, this time using false color to your point. Uh, to uh, uh, again bring out uh, the uh, the uh, uh, gases of different uh, of uh, different composition, methane and ammonia, for example. Uh, this is a fantastic image of one of the uh, Jovian moons first observed by Galileo, uh, but shown against uh, uh, against its parent uh, planet, uh, Jupiter. I can't remember which moon it is. It says so. What is it? I don't know. It might be. I don't know. It says it's fourth largest moon, and I don't remember the sizes of moons and so on. Are so. you going to tell people you took them? N no, I didn't take them. <laughs> I, I, I processed them, but I didn't take them. I, I took them and, and uh, made them look sexy for NASA's sake. So, <laughs> so there are photographs that I did take. I'm going to let Josh talk about those photographs. I don't like to talk about my own work. Oh, come on, Steve. <laughs> Too modest. Well, um, this is from a project um, that Steve uh, worked on for, I don't know, how many, how many years? Uh, four or five, something like four that. Four or five years. Um, where he took uh, details of photographs not taken by Steve of Mars. It's from the database that I mentioned. And from this publicly accessible database. Um, isolated details of them and juxtaposed them with photographs he did take of similar phenomenon here uh, on, on Earth. And um, there, there is a, um, uh, a sort of uh, large project with, with uh, many chapters. And so we have examples of Stephen helping out here. We have... Uh, this was taken on the surface of, of Mars by the uh, uh, Opportunity uh, Lander. This was taken near Flagstaff, uh, uh, near Sunset Crater. Uh, these, are uh, these are volcanic cinder cones on the surface of Mars, and this is just a piece of volcanic rock on Earth. These are sand dunes on Mars, again, to scale. These are about a mile on, on a side. These are wind-eroded uh, walls, the canyon walls, the canyon de Chez. And here is carbon dioxide ice on top of water ice near one of the poles of Mars and then an ice pattern from Earth. So that's, there's a book coming out this fall. University of Arizona Press has, I've forgotten, there's something like 90 images or image mm -hmm. pairs, I should say. So uh, it'll be out this fall and has text by planetary astronomer Brad Smith. So that's enough for me. <laughs> I don't like mm -hmm. me. We have one more room, the sun room. Uh, and um, this is worth being in. This is, this is sort of, as a child of the, of the, of the 60s, you know, you, you would be lying down uh, and don't laugh. What do you think you're know, doing? I mean, so this is, so what are you looking at? These, I've forgotten what wavelength at which these take. This was taken by, as I mentioned before, the Solar Dynamics Explorer. Uh, it records uh, um, images of the sun. I forgot, I, I, I've forgotten whether it's every minute or something like that. In any event, it, it, it takes continuous, nearly continuous photographs of the surface of the sun and does so at a variety of wavelengths, ranging from the X-ray region of the, of the, of, of the, uh, of the spectrum 
uh, all the way up to, uh, to um, the ultraviolet region of the, of the spectrum. And what you're looking at uh, in these image, images uh, is activity at, this, at, the, at the surface of the sun. Uh, in this particular case, you're looking at very high energy plasma. This is probably 100,000 to a million degree plasma. And the reason that they're following these beautiful patterns is that, uh, is that uh, the plasma in this particular case is being confined by magnetic field lines that emerge from uh, one sunspot area on the left and to the other area of what was on the right. Uh, here, I think you're looking at the, uh, at, uh, the region near the, uh, the stellar chromosphere, and what you're looking at is a, is a mass ejection. Uh, I don't know whether it gets out or whether it drops back or not. But by looking at different wavelengths, you're able to look from the very surface of the sun, where, which you can see with your naked eye. Well, you can see if you would through filters with your naked eye, uh, uh, the photosphere, all the way up to the corona, which we talked about when we were looking at R Richard uh, Lauren's uh, images of the solar, uh, solar eclipse. And the purpose of these images is to try to understand how energy propagates from the nuclear engine in the center of the, of the sun uh, all the way out through the corona and to try to use that understanding so that we, we can, uh, for e example, uh, get a, a better handle on the, uh, the um, um, uh, on predicting, for example, the comings of, of major solar storms. But well, you'd also like to know for knowledge's sake. And here you can see these, these, these loops arise of, of hot gas arising from the surface of the sun and, um, and being, some being ejected into space and other returning along magnetic field lines to the surface of the, of the sun. And uh, I should also say that they're on, on board the same, I think it's the same satellite, but it, it, as part of the same suite of missions, it, I, I know this is going to sound really implausible, but it turns out that uh, by carefully measuring, um, uh, by making careful m measurements of what am am amount to sound waves propagating through the, uh, through the sun, it's possible to infer from those measurements not just the distribution of uh, temperature and density from the surface of the sun into its core, but also to um, uh, discern the effects of differential rotation, that is, the core of the sun is rotating more rapidly than the surface of the sun. Uh, it's possible to do that, all from doing the same thing that people who uh, infer the structure of the Earth do, you know, the folks who are, the seismologists are able to infer the, uh, uh, the, the structure of the Earth through propagation of sound waves through the, uh, through, uh, through the Earth's surface, it's possible to do the same sort of thing on the sun. And there's a part of this, this suite of missions which, which does, uh, does that. But I think it's best to end by simply looking at these images, uh, reflecting on the ingenuity of man, reflecting on how your invest, the investment of your tax dollars is advancing. Uh, advancing knowledge as well as producing these pictures and uh, also perhaps reflecting on, on how wonderful it would be if all of human activity were motivated by this sort of thing rather than some of the other things we spend time on. So thanks a lot. Much appreciated. <laughs>
Um, only a handful of them are from here, the, the CCP's collection. The majority of them are from um, the, the Space Imager Center, that's uh, it's a facility housed within the Planetary uh, Lab. So um, eventually these things have to go back to their, to their various homes, but we're hopeful that a, a core of the show can, can have another life. But it's, uh, it's a, a, a thank you so much for, for asking the question and being even interested enough to ask because the question. Sure. This is such a beautiful show and so thoughtful and the media rich. I mean, it's one that should tour, but. Thanks for saying that. Um, can you get a grant to pull that together? Uh, it's, it's possible, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's something that, you know, the grant cycles uh, takes quite a long time. Uh, it, uh, I, I Could you have done that two years ago? <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. It, we, we would have had to have this out two years ago, but uh, in point of fact, um, we, we only had about a three months to put this together. I saw this a week before it was put together, and I thought to myself that Josh and Andrew could not possibly create this space in a week, but I was wrong, as I have been about so many other things. They did a remarkable job. Thank you.